call to the WHO who said there's a, who said there's a disaster and they tweeted, MSF, stop exaggerating. You're going to damage the economy of West Africa by making these unfounded allegations of an out of control epidemic. Um, and they just retracted that last week and then they retracted the retraction. But uh, we wound up basically taking care of uh, most of the actual treatment. We did uh, at least up until uh, December of uh, 2014, our cumulative number of patients was somewhat greater than everyone else's combined. Um, we did an enormous amount of the actual treatment. We, uh, the, the largest Ebola center in history had been ours in Uganda, <coughs> with 20 beds. The largest one we'd ever made contingency plans for was 30 beds. And in Monrovia, we had one that was 400 beds, and that was only one of them. We had several. Um, so the outbreak was, was orders of magnitude greater than our worst nightmares uh, and than our worst contingency plans. And we reached absolute saturation capacity. So just to, to sort of set the stage a bit, there was a moment in uh, Monrovia in Liberia where our doctors and nurses were turning away people at the door who were dying of Ebola and emitting bodily fluids full of Ebola virus, and we sent them away to die in the street and infect others because our centers were so full that any more people inside them would kill more of our staff. We lost some of our staff already, and had we lost any more, we would not have been able to continue. We would have had to fold up altogether, so we turned people away dying of Ebola into the streets to give it to others. That's how bad it got. Uh, my colleague who was uh, in Monrovia at the time described it as the seventh circle of hell. So what did we wind up doing? Uh, our specific role, because there were very few people with that level four isolation capacity able to run the Ebola management centers, um, that was what we mainly did. So th the fight against Ebola is principally won by, by making sure that everyone who has it gets access to care and isolation. At best, they get care. During a lot of our intervention, they didn't get care. They got food, water, and isolation so they wouldn't kill their families while they died. Um, it, was, it was a pretty grim time. Therefore, MSF specifically didn't have as much need or interest in spatial information. So to answer Nicole's question about what role did spatial information play, we were mainly running fixed sites where we would receive people and provide them with hopefully care, but at least isolation. Uh, and certainly, you know, for once our capacity increased and the caseload went down, we did provide good care. Uh, now, how do you actually stop Ebola? Nigeria showed how to stop Ebola. They got a case. It transmitted to a couple of other people. They aggressively traced every contact. Contact tracing is 21 days of every single person who's been in contact with the case of Ebola gets checked every single day for 21 days until, they, until they're proven negative. Uh, and Nigeria, by aggressively taking the, well, taking the infection seriously and doing aggressive contact tracing, they stopped it from even getting loose in the first place. This didn't happen in West Africa, principally because uh, the world has not seen fit to provide all that much primary health care out there. So there's no system that can actually take that on, that, that contact tracing and that basic health care. So um, the way you actually win with Ebola is, yes, you have to have enough treat treatment capacity to isolate and treat everyone, but you also need to be able to contact trace. Here's where spatial information comes in. When a person walks into any kind of clinic anywhere in the world, I'm sure all of you have been to the doctor at least once in your life, and they tend to say, where are you from? Why? Because if there's that, a whole lot of cases of Legionnaire's disease in you know, a particular neighborhood of Washington, they're going to start checking the restaurants. Uh, the classic case was John Snow in 1854 in London, seeing a cluster of cases of cholera on Broad Street and finding a pump that was the source of the epidemic and stopping it. Well, now, with Ebola, when we did manage to map our cases, we actually found certain hotspots where there was uh, where there was uh, higher levels of transmission than elsewhere. That's where you focus your preventative efforts. So, the ultimate goal of HOT, if uh, if I could permit myself to, to extrapolate something, is that in a parallel world, in a parallel universe where there is no humanitarian open street map, more people have died because the operational decisions that people needed to make based on the information in the map and the patient data, etc., weren't made. So the way, as a consumer of HOT's data, I consider that, that HOT has succeeded when the data that it generates and the maps that it generate cause operational decision makers in the humanitarian field to allocate their resources more effectively and fewer people die. That's what we haven't, in my view, achieved in very many places yet.
in fact, I would say that, that that really is a dream yet to be realized. We've got a few glimmerings of how it's going to work, but not yet. And I would say that Ebola is a case in point that in an MSF center, which is probably one of the most advanced centers anywhere in West Africa, we have a list of patient origins, and 70% of them can't be accurately georeferenced. So we don't know where the infections are in the wild. So for those that we did, I mean, how was it dealing with hot? It was amazing. We, we asked for help, and we received it in massive, massive scale. However, by the very nature of the emergency, because the base map wasn't there in the first place, and when I say base map, to be able to actually identify a patient by their origin, I need more than just a couple of village names. I need to know what administrative divisions those villages are in. Where are you from? Makum. There's seven of those. Which one? There's a lot more that I need than just village names on a map. I need, I need a lot more information to be able to disambiguate where my patient is from. And because the base map wasn't really in place before the disaster happened, and because inherently, not anybody's fault, it takes time to put together a base map. And it takes time to get adoption by everyone. And there's competing systems, and you've got the damn PICOs and all that stuff. It was very difficult to actually share data effectively for us to be able to, from the data we have, which is where our patients come from, translate that into proper coordinates and provide it to the people who are responsible for doing the contact tracing, the outreach, and the prevention efforts. So what should be done with this in the future? Let's finish it, because it's not over. Ebola came out of the forest once and actually got loose in a, in a, in a major epidemic. That was the first time that's ever happened, but it won't be the last. So what to do with the data in West Africa? Let's finish the job, and let's make sure that that base map is in place for everyone forever, and let's keep maintaining it, and then let's replicate it everywhere. Let's start doing this in the next place where Ebola is going to come out of the forest, which is probably Congo. Okay, I hope I didn't go over my mic for my time. <laughs> we'll permit it. Thumb. Okay. And uh, one question to ponder that I had to ruminate on a little bit is, from the starting place we were at, how could we have done better as hot? Just, just a thought. Just a thought to think about. I think what's. Well, I, th I, I was trying to make the point that I don't think there was much more we could have done. But I, I, I disagree. Um, IMAP, um, I'm with IMAP, and we deploy five IMOs to support in each affected country uh, the cluster system and in responding to this emergency as uh, data coordinators. And accessing HOT at the onset of the emergency was very difficult. Obviously, for logistics purposes and helping um, uh, WFP uh, and CDC and others uh, deal with logistics later on in the operation, they got a little bit smoother and we were able to use uh, some open street map information and getting down to the city levels, but the deficiencies are open street map when it comes to boundaries and administrative units is extremely deficient. Um, also features like schools, clinics that are already in existence Maybe those should be prioritized much higher in the HOT framework than roads and building footprints because those are features that the people on the ground dealing with the information and trying to respond need immediately. And without that, we couldn't show gaps, which um, the last I found out, you know, uh, US DOD went over to build health clinics. They didn't even build a small portion of those because they went out and they're like, why aren't we gonna build a huge health clinic in a village of 50 people? It's, it's not well thought out, it wasn't planned. The assessments that were done back in, in Washington or on the desktop did not actually pan out when you got out into the field. Also, people were scared and how much preparation took to get out into the field, you didn't have the mobilization that we do with other emergencies. And HOT needs to adjust based on a, a health emergency versus a natural disaster versus a civil conflict. And look at what features are going to support the cluster system in making decisions, not just focusing on, on roads and buildings. Because people aren't going to use roads and buildings until two to six weeks after the initial response in a lot of these communities. There's a, there's a bit of a uh, tension here with what hot can do. And uh, one question that I had, had was named to Ivan was, how do we get better information from the field as we're in the 
mix of a uh, response information in terms of what can we be doing better, but also, I mean, the kind of features we're talking about are not easily collected from loads of volunteers who are only digitizing satellite imagery. So that's, so the challenge then is um, if we do need local knowledge for other data sources with the right licensing, how do we facilitate that, especially in the midst of a, of a crisis? Well, I don't know if, if who all's here. For, for me, I've been in the field for 15 years in, in terms of data diplomat. Their regional center, MSF, has the location of the clinics that they have served and stuff like that. And during an emergency, those are not proprietary data sets that can be brought to bear on an emergency. But a lot of times that's being tossed around in a circle that is not necessarily within the hot membership. Sir, a follow up from the Sure. Um, so my name is Ryan Lash. I work at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention in Atlanta, Georgia. Um, I um, was involved in the Ebola response, um, but um, kind of in the second wave, so to speak. Um, um, I, uh, because of other job duties, um, uh, uh, wasn't involved really until, um, I guess, August and September, um, and then I eventually deployed in November and December to Sierra Leone, uh, working primarily out of Freetown, but did get to travel uh, to uh, two or three other districts. Um, since returning, um, I've continued to be involved. So CDC, the Emergency Operations System, CINDER rather, is divided up into different you know, teams and, and groups. Um, so I've continued to be on the uh, land border team um, who is particularly interested in completing the map um, at this point because um, uh, we you know, see that cross-border transmission of the, of the disease is how it eventually ended up in three countries. Um, and, um, and the only way it's going to get out of all of those three countries is, is to strengthen um, uh, the border, what borders are doing, et cetera. Um, I, um, I'm not certain that I necessarily have a response to this um, immediate conversation um, that is taking place there. Um, but I would say that, um, you know, CDC's experience with HOT, um, I think is, is fairly unique part because we are, you know, pretty official and pretty by the book, and um, and I had a hard time um, communicating to my leadership who HOT was, or who HOT is, was at the time that we were talking about it. Um, and um, in that regard, um, I want to say thanks again to Matt Gibb for being there and having had the forethought to create that, because from the CDC perspective, HOT is an organization which they don't have a relationship with, didn't have a relationship prior to Ebola, and um, lots of other folks were clamoring for CDC's endorsements or support, um, and it was difficult for that. Um, whereas with MapGiv being another federal agency, it was really easy um, to get behind them and, and support that. That being said, GIS, um, in the response, I think Ivan characterized it well in that um, um, when I was speaking with friends in the field in August, um, and talking about maps and GIS, they're like, this doesn't even scratch our top 10 list of problems right now um, um, for the people who are there in the field. The other thing um, that I wanted to thank MSF for was um, um, after their work in March, they um, hired a consultant and published a case study on the role of GIS officers in the field in, in Hine. That was published in July. Um, and I quickly grabbed a hold of that and tried to circulate it to as many people as I could. Um, I've got a panel discussion plan back at CDC um, to try to stimulate more discussion because the role and the idea that they described for a GIS officer, I'm not certain that CDC really has um, staff um, currently uh, employed that meet the kind of requirements or the descriptions of the roles and responsibilities of what GIS officers are doing. Doing. And I don't know that that's the agency's fault necessarily. Um, partly, um, you know, mapping in GIS um, is continues to be unevenly distributed throughout the agency. Um, geography, um, as as a discipline, is not widely represented. Instead, um, you know, leadership really comes from medical doctors and epidemiologists, um, and um, and students uh, or people with, with training as uh, masters of public health programs. 
so one of the things we have to reconcile with is that we have a lot of people at CDC who are in the role of being a GIS person in their group, um, but their background in GIS may be limited to one semester's class that was an intro to GIS. And depending on the, the, the routine work that they do, they may not have advanced beyond you know, the basics of making a coral cleft map. Um, so, um, so I'm here to learn um, and to, to take back as much as I can. Um, because um, CDC, I think, is, is representative of other institutions that are big places that have power and resources, um, and um, and there's also, um, it, you know, it takes time to build up inertia and to adopt new technologies, and that's what I personally um, am, in, am invested in doing. So um, I'm happy to field additional questions as they come up. And, and would would it be fair to say? difficult to participate because Skype is not authorized for installation on the CDC computer. <laughs> so I was initially using my cell phone um, and then started carrying around my own laptop where I could go to another building that had an open Wi-Fi network um, to be able to, to participate in that dialogue. Um, and, and so it's that situation, you know, which limits who's willing to participate. It's not just who can, but who, in this case, who, who's willing to I wanted to pose what I think are some pressing needs um, and unmet needs currently in the Ebola response from the land border perspective. Um, because um, right now it looks like 
we could say that, that maybe the, the two larger or largest hot spots continue to be um, in a district in Sierra Leone called Cambia um, and its neighboring district in, um, in Guinea, um, uh, Port Ferry Prefecture. Um, and I did a quick um, analysis looking at the number of residential land use polygons that had been identified within Port Carrier Prefecture and the numbers of them which had a place name node inside of that residential polygon, or I, I think it did a little buffer. But it was basically 90% of the residential locations were missing place names. And I understand exactly why that problem exists because you know remote mapping volunteers are working through satellite imagery. They obviously don't have place names, right? But at the same token, it takes some organization time and energy to build the relationships with the local Census Bureau who does have um, that data set. Um, or the alternative is, is, is that we have, are faced with a much, what I think is, a, is an equally challenging proposition of trying to find volunteers um, who, who are in those locations who, who can begin to map. But I personally am of the opinion that, that it is worthwhile to try to build that relationship with the Census Bureau. And, and in doing so, recognizing that we are totally disrupting their business model. <laughs> um, and in some ways, um, I feel like, you know, USA should be willing to pay whatever number, whatever price they ask, you know, because this, this data is, is arguably invaluable. Um, and, and that's what happened in, in Liberia. It's fascinating to see in three different countries how resources and, and data, you know, could be so dramatically different. In Liberia, if I recall correctly, I think, um, the unmill operation had good place names, um, and HOT was able to get that data with an appropriate data license, and it was imported. So the place name problem wasn't as big in Liberia. Um, it um, was bigger in Sierra Leone, and from what I observed on the ground, the Census Bureau was not directly engaged, and it was not, I didn't have the authority uh, in my role at CDC to be the one trying to, to engage with them. And it looks like the problem in Guinea is arguably worse far as the number of locations that have place names. I had an interesting experience with the place names in Pakalili district where we couldn't match uh, very many of the patients and village names. We did have the Census Bureau's um, uh, data uh -huh. and the problem we identified right away is that the, the census data was pretty old and the census data was based on political decisions. So the villages quite often self-declare So that said, I, I don't mean completely throw the baby out with the bathwater. Certainly involve them, but disrupt their business model, indeed, because their business model is not actually serving their population the way it needs. And again, that's a very MSF, you know, throw everything away and just take over kind of way of doing business, which doesn't, which is totally inappropriate outside of emergencies. Mm -hmm. Don't get me wrong, I don't think you do that anywhere where there's not an emergency. But when you've got 5,000 Ebola patients in a three week doubling period, it's probably a good idea to just. Well, and, structures. I, and, and I think that, that that's, that's the great thing about HOT as an organization is you and I can both be equal members and equal contributors. Um, I'm hamstrung by policy that says we are going to support the Ministry of Health. Regardless of whatever the Ministry of Health was or wasn't doing beforehand, we are there in the country uh, um, to, 
because of an invitation from the host country, and they could throw us out at any point in time. Um, and so our process is slow, um, and it's not quick. Uh, but, um, <laughs> but that's kind of how slow it was. Um, yeah, but, but anyhow, you know, to, to be here and, and to be discussing things is, is, is I think, really helpful. And in terms of what we should do going forward, also not be afraid to say to the USAID and BIFID and all the various agencies there of the you know two and a half billion dollars we allocated to Ebola, why don't you put a couple hundred thousand into uh, into paying local people with the cell phones to uh, to go collect the, the village names. And let's just put let's be respectful in the sense we just put them in an alternate name layer. Yeah. Which is just trying to reflect what we think people in the village themselves who identify as their place of origin just doesn't mean we're contesting the official name. It's just what it is that the peer community is doing. They give whatever informal name that they got for their village, which from a medical perspective, we need. And, and that doesn't mean that we want to actually take over naming of villages from the government, their official function. But I mean, that would be something to, to do moving forward is let's, uh, let's not be shy to, I mean, what was the old Wikipedia thing? Be bold. We should, probably should. Yeah. It's really interesting. an instance where a particular NGO had bought 150 GPS units and spent two days training people um, to use the GPS units. Um, um, but they um, didn't have a broader data management plan for how that data was actually going to be processed and where it was going to go. Um, and um, so um, on the ground in Freetown, at least, it was, it was a pretty chaotic place. Particularly regarding GIS, um, you know, it, there wasn't one one organization who is there from start to finish that I'm aware of um, really leading that. At least that's what I observed in, in, in Sierra Leone. And so um, that, that's I think just another complicating factor. Ben, did you have something else? Yeah, uh, I even said before that uh, uh, like it's inappropriate to map those villages even when they don't have official names, but that's actually what OpenStreetMap has been doing. No, no, it's inappropriate to completely sideline the, uh, the official structures. Yeah, but that's what OpenStreetMap has been doing. It's one of the... Well, when Eureka and I were in Congo, maps, we went yeah. to visit the mayor before well, we I mean, left the city. Yeah, of course. We did engage the official structures. I mean, yeah, and I understand it doesn't that mean that we agree that we're only going to work through them, but, but we don't, we don't, we don't sideline them. Whereas in an emergency, but it's a fair point that there are many, whether it's remote mapping or even yeah. field mapping activities. And was it, uh, yeah, the Eureka's sort of typology yesterday, right? Where it's like that <laughs> different degrees of participation. And so, yeah, those all have been applied in different places. I think it's always been a this dynamic with these authority authorities, even back at the start of OpenStreetMap, <coughs> where it was definitely started as a reaction to the National Mapping Agency. But very, very quickly, you had, like, Ed Parsons, who's the CTO of Jordan Survey at, at the time. He was at the first state of the map, like, so there was, al there was always an exchange and there is a back and forth and a relationship. It's definitely, like, a different way of doing things and it's going to be a complex relationship. When you can cooperate, it's great, but if, if it's not appropriate to cooperate, you know, you can make that decision as well. You don't need to necessarily stop. Uh, so I'm Benson from, from State, from the Humanitarian Information Unit. Um, I want to maybe place a couple markers just for future discussions because they've come up already. So there's, um, well, just what came up in the previous session about these linkages of the census in particular, but these formal, you know, everything we've been talking about right now. We need a deeper dive on this.
us when you look at the way certain larger institutions have started focus on the bank, the FDRR, um, and not that it's perfect or infallible, but that for us even, if we are, we are, those are the examples we are often pointing to where they are taking an open data approach but working with the informal authorities, whether it's at a national or sub-national level, um, and that approach, even if it's not perfect just for us, explaining this given as part of the state resonates and people get like, oh, you can, and this even in the context of an executive order and an administration who's all about open data, open everything, you know, it doesn't match with the kind of these formal approaches and legacies put in place by you know, cost recovery models that, that the state of the or the World Bank or others have kind of pushed for many, many years. And so if you create data, you should own it and you should sell it, you know, and incentivize it. Um, so, but there is emerging, I think there's, far as the response, I mean, from where I sit here in state, we're not even, we don't sit in a regional bureau or in a part of USAID that's sort of directly involved in response, but we're always in this information management space, and we're in the Office of the Geographer, so we're always doing satellite imagery and maps. We've always had those sort of formal relationships with, with NGA, with the satellite agency. Um, so I can't, I don't see any of our NGA colleagues in the room, but as far as like how we data, um, USG-wide, like, like we mentioned earlier, like OpenStreetMap is, it is becoming the base map for a lot of these urgent responses. Um, so, which is great, but that's also, that's a lot of responsibility, people, you know, <laughs> like, it, and, the, and with Ebola, um, it was great that NGA was putting out map atlases based on OSM, but they weren't even pulling current OSM data at first. They were pulling kind of whatever they found on the web from some site that was out fix that, um, and, and there's a lot of, within the call response, there are a lot of these sources that were quickly available for current, current extracts. Um, so, you know, but yeah, being used, absolutely, lots of room for improvement. Um, the other marker I wanted to place for a future discussion was on the administrative boundaries thing. I know Dale at Crisis Mappers is like, I don't ever want to talk about licenses, you know, I, uh, and, you know and it came up in the context of boundaries, but this issue just keeps coming up over and over again. It is such a, an essential and problematic operational need from what I keep hearing over and over again from folks who are more often in the field. And it's wrapped up in a very real way with UN politics and how they're in, and other formal institutions and how they're engaging with the governments. Um, and not to mention being a limiting factor, at least in terms of perception and the utility of OpenStreetMap in particular. So there are, there have been good workflows that have worked around this in certain places, but we need to do a lot better documenting those and building on them. And that's, and I wanted to post up on just the documentation in general that Raquel mentioned this morning, and second what Ryan said, but back just in terms of the report that NSF put out um, was so useful for us uh, in terms of something that at least even if it was like into the second wave, but during the ongoing response, and at least as far as the US government, really even before we really got involved, um, you know, starting in the summer, late summer, um, when there was the big surge of activity. So for us, trying to advance the agenda and the notion of the value of geography and geographic information generally, but OpenStreetMap in particular, having that to point to was incredibly useful. And it's so rare to have something that's so sort of cogent in the midst of the ongoing response. Um, so we're definitely drawing on that as well. Um, I didn't get to all my things that I, that I, that I should have said about. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Well, no, I, I think the only other thing is just to answer the questions was like, um, the best thing and worst, worst thing, I think I kind of touched on everything else was. Yeah, um, my phone died, so I can't. Yeah. I forget what the questions um, were. But yeah, and I, you know, I was smiling because I'm, meanwhile, like just reliving this and emailing, like, it was like, I get data from a guy in WFP, like FYI, on like some data that I won't mention because you're all probably in the Skype chat. Um, so, and I'm like, oh, I saw a question about this. What's the license? I'll share it internally within the USG unless you tell me otherwise. And, you know, <laughs> is it on your, you know, like, so these insane issues coming up. Um, so best thing and worst thing, uh, it was, you'll hear more about map give, so I won't go into the background there, but like, we're still very much in this nascent stage. And as much as, even though 
it's an official State Department initiative, like, that was a trick. Like, we tricked people into sponsoring this. It doesn't really mean anything, like, to many people at the department, um, let alone USAID. Um, so it's great that we have that backing, but that was, it still framed much more in that, like, volunteerism, crowdsourcing, like, data is good. Um, when we come back to the desk officer who is responsible for X country, or a program officer who's actually funding programs there, that work of explaining, okay, no, really, this is how the data are used, and this is why it's important, and like, that's, that is the day-to-day -day challenge. Um, so it was, it's still frustrating to have precious few, like, really tangible examples, um, good narratives, but, but still lacking, relatively lacking in that regard. Um, but most frustrating to us was that we weren't asked to help as far as satellite imagery until like the second wave. So we really wanted to do more early when the Guinea response took off. Um, and uh, I think we're, we're glad, to, I think that a lot of the imagery wasn't like, purchased necessarily, but um, you know, we wanted the opportunity to just have clear operational need, but we need to be asked to support it. That's it. So I want to throw a couple other things out there. One was to follow up on, on, on the use cases and, and examples. It's, I don't think it's necessarily well documented yet, but um, a close friend of mine um, who's been working in Haiti for the last three years um, supporting the cholera surveillance, um, she has, uh, has great examples of the value of the OpenStreetMap data um, that was generated, obviously, and, and uh, the communities that built that. Um, um, it's still a really valuable you know, piece of, of public health infrastructure. And that's what, to me, is exciting for, for the Ebola situation because there are tremendous health needs, unmet health needs that exist right now that aren't touched because of Ebola. Um, and, uh, and so this is gonna be, you know, obviously a prolonged thing. The other thing that's perhaps too little and too late, but um, um, I heard the, the frustrations on the listservs um, about not hearing and seeing feedback from the field. Um, and I finally got four photos up on the CDC Flickr account. Um, so if you Google, um, CDC Ebola Flickr. Um, you'll get to a page, and they're like, the, I think it's you know the last four. But anyhow, one of them um, is my friend Yoshi standing in front of a car with a tablet, um, looking at OSMAN. It's got a CDC sticker on the side. Um, um, so hopefully that's um, uh, appreciated um, by a few of the folks. Um, and then also the t two two to three. To the lay people, to the to the people in the field who aren't GIS users, um, who don't consider themselves um, mapping experts, um, the, the 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 data offline on a tablet, OSMAN, um, is inspiring them. I, they're going to want more of that, um, and I want to give them more of that um, because um, you know five or six times again, OpenStreetMap was not at all part of my portfolio of things that I was supposed to be working on. In but I was able to load up a few tablets and hand them out to folks, and everybody came back and said, it's awesome. I was up in, in Tonanduga District, and there was a village map and buildings were there even. Um, and um, so, um, so I think one of the things I'm excited about is to try to grow OpenStreetMap and HOT within the, the, the public health community, because I'm not certain um, we've really expanded um, significantly um, beyond that as we already Geospatial experts and GIS number of folks, but I think we're getting there. Maybe I could just uh, throw a comment or a question. So I know in the past uh, there's been like UNICEF and ports of health facilities. Is there any like talk about um, trying to, you know, do that when a cluster stands up, like a wash cluster or a health cluster, and try to like say, okay, you know, as we're starting our response or intervention. Conflict was considered ongoing, so probably 2013 for health facilities. Um, the I, I don't know the guys, but in Nepal uh, already had an active yeah. hot project where they did schools and hospitals. So uh, it it seems to be moving in that direction. Where I think it impacts is those things can be collected from open source from you know, Google as just googling 
Google and trying to find out and moving it over to the OpenStreetMap. It's the local level of is that an actual hospital or is it a clinic? Does it do maternity? Does it have an x-ray machine, EKG, and stuff like that? And that's that's where we're starting to see in places like Syria that you're adding more health facilities and clinics to OSM and then they're linking those back and, and keeping a side database within the cluster of more detailed information. That's happening in Jordan and Syria. Okay, that's in interesting so I mean maybe this is kind of like a side conversation like why they would choose to do that rather than place an open, open street map um, but I wanted to come back to what Ryan was saying about photos because in the MSF report this was actually uh, noted as a, a point of confusion um, there was a part of the seems to be there's a sort of like there's like a misunderstanding on both sides about like what's possible and what 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 are the priorities as well as like what are the maybe the motivations of people to take the part in front of it. Yeah. I don't know if you noted that, but I know that I don't know if you remember if you, if you read the report, but there's definitely something it's like, huh, I'm not sure that quite got into the meat of what, what was going on there in terms of a misunderstanding that there was maybe the relationship of motivations of remote volunteers, like people the working the, on the ground. I, if I recall the report's language, I think that the, the, this is the MSF case study of, of uh, you know, GIS and mobile health. Um, that it said something to the effect of, you know, that, that volunteers had been, you know, OpenStreetMap volunteers had been extremely effective in mapping um, areas. Um, one of the challenges faced by MSF was the expectation by OpenStreetMap volunteers for um, for more routine feedback than what was being delivered, um, which um, maybe Mikkel, you're saying that that might not have been an accurate interpretation of, of the communication. Or no, I think I mean, there was yeah, there was a bit of couching in there. Um, is there a camera rolling? <laughs> <laughs> All right, <laughs> that was a bit of couching and some frustration. sense that the OpenStreetMap volunteers wanted to make a lot of hay of what they've done, and they, and they, and they mapped, they did a great job of mapping Yekadu, and that was helpful, not massively life-saving, but certainly helpful, and then they went on for weeks and weeks and weeks very publicly about how they had saved all these lives in Guinea, and the MSFers started with, yes, great job, yeah, yeah, that was good, thank you, guys, enough. something which was only a small contribution uh, did not entirely or even mostly originate within the uh, you can't control the crowd but you can't no. control the press so it is <laughs> yeah. you know they, as the media cycle goes on and Ebola is such a still a, a protracted crisis like, they need to come up with something new and at some point it's like oh there's this technology angle to what's going on and that's when you started seeing these bigger articles and maybe making claims like Nepal was mapped in 48 hours after the earthquake. Which is <laughs> the earthquake was mapped in 48 hours. The earth what does that even mean? <laughs> <laughs> it's a great, right there, right there. great headline, but misleading. Can I throw in one? Uh, uh, well, wait, wait, I, don't, had, I don't, please, I have a question. Okay. No, I just wanted to answer this.
data was already there when the cholera hit because of the earthquake. So it was an example of where there was an extraordinarily good face mask in place that included some administrative provisions. Mm -hmm. And we, from the first day that we opened in Paul's Pants, we actually were taking patient noise as corresponding to something that we could map. And that's gone on today. It is the only place in, in my 13 year career in MSF where from day one of an epidemic, we actually had a face map that was useful. And that was because we had the good fortune of a way bad fortune of an enormous earthquake and a huge mapping effort just before. But to then to, to further on that point, and something you said as well, administrative divisions are the key. It, it looks great to have imagery, it looks great to have tracing over top of the imagery, it looks great to have tags on all of the tracery. If you still can't identify an alert or a patient origin or, or a health promotion piece of data without the administrative division, and we have to find a way to get that. And all the argument about licenses is indeed a huge impediment. But to some extent, it's moot in a lot of the country where you've got most admin three that even exists um, anywhere outside of a sketched paper map. I think we, we as an LSM community have to just say, all right, we're taking on, we have to do the admin division. When you start doing field mapping of villages and you stop in the village, you simply say, what province are you in? What district are you in from that province? And okay, fine, that's just should check against the, the divisions that you have from wherever. But then, all right, what are the next divisions? Are they wards or constituencies or subsections or whatever? You gotta ask, and you gotta start just allocating to each villages, and then you can do pseudo boundaries around them. Because frankly, most of the places, I mean, in Congo, there are administrative divisions which exist. The only way in which they do exist is that the, whoever is politically in charge of that division knows which villages are in it, and the corresponding village chiefs know who they report to, but there physically does not exist an actual map. Well, we can do one. So we have to just take that on, and, and then the question of the license becomes moot because we don't. So that, that would, for me, would be a challenge to the LSM community. Let's, let's build administrative divisions, as you suggested, right into it and bake it in in the first place and make it usable but also prioritize the production. We have a really good point. We have three minutes. I wanted to see if there was any other points. I was also kind of looking at Drupal a little bit because we took part almost a year ago in an open boundaries discussion in this very building. Um, if you wanted to like inspire yeah. uh, inspire direction to, to build on what yeah, we, I had uh, said. We had a, what we call it a boundary camp, I guess, yeah, just about a year ago. We sort of had a group of people, including some of the private sector folks that had the same problem. Um, talk about how we sort of aggregate all the world's boundaries over time and go up to the creative solution to do that in Paul Sam. And I think we came away with some good ideas, but realized it was going to be a larger effort than just sort of the volunteers we have in the room for the day. So we have been pretty much following the event, but we've certainly been thinking a lot about this, and I'd be happy to talk to anybody about additional ideas and how to improve it. Any other points before we move closer? No other questions? Nobody has any questions? We, I mean, we do have to close, but it's, we certainly when have time. We'll, we'll, have, we'll close with, uh, with uh, Nathan's point. Um, does any, so can anyone talk to, if things are going on, on the ground right now, like what the state of the Kokomo is, for example, did you map any? I've heard of a few things. So, I, I mean, it, it comes in drips. Uh, Fred Moy, I heard, just randomly was doing a training with university students. I mean, I have no idea of the context of exactly what was going on there or, or what, it, what it, it was part of something larger. So that was one point. We, I don't know how much you want to, we've had a little bit of discussions about. Uh, you showed OSM address of folks over there. There were some people who are, I don't know if you want to talk, there's some people who are uh, heading into Guinea who have this maybe in their mind. Oh, right, yeah. Um, uh, it, I'm not certain. So CDC is is going to be deploying um, additional GIS a analytics to Guinea um, uh, in the coming weeks. Um, and uh, and again, part of this is still experimental because because GIS is not something the agency normally thinks about sending to the field. Um, um, but anyhow, um, I'm not certain what really what you were trying maybe to maybe it was say. A, maybe it was a dream. That I had about <laughs> these folks um, doing some OSM training. 
Yeah, no, no, I, I, I think that, I think it's possible. Um, I don't know exactly who they're going to be working with. I think at the moment they may be trying to work some with the national statistics. So, uh, so that'll be an interesting challenge. Yeah, to me, I guess the other potential opportunity there that may be missing maps to follow up on offline is the idea of using the diaspora. Um, and um, in Atlanta, we have a large Liberian community. Um, and, and from what I heard from them, they were frustrated because there wasn't anything they could do beyond send money um, and talk to people. And so clearly they, they, they could have been mapping, um, but figuring out in the realm of teach OSM and how, how, do, how do we begin to get some curriculums for, for dealing with those sorts of communities in San Francisco um, is a useful endeavor. Well, thank you very much. We have a lot more to talk about, obviously. We have the rest of the day tomorrow, so, and forever. <laughs> 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 <laughs>